Goering the flamboyant. Hermann Goering was a large, loud, flamboyant man. He was genuinely charismatic, but also a figure of ridicule. He is well remembered in many movies and TV series as such. His uniform's weight and obsession with glamour made him as notorious as his actual military and political functions. Goering was commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, managed the economy, and was the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany, behind Hitler. A young Goering was charming, fit, and a genuine war hero. He earned Imperial Germany's highest award, the Pour le Merite, or Blue Max, for gallantry serving as a World War I fighter pilot while flying with the Richthofen Squadron. When Goering joined the Nazi party in 1922, he considered himself socially superior to most members. But he fit in. He was anti-Semitic, nationalist, and liked authoritarianism. As a war hero, he provided credibility to the party and quickly became a prominent figure. When World War II started, Goering focused as much energy on the war as he did his own image and status. He accumulated vast wealth. He collected art and antiques stolen from Jewish collections. He liked flashy cars and weapons. His opulent collections went as far as World War I aircraft, a full-size luxury train, and castles. He kept lion cubs borrowed from the Berlin Zoo, which would be swapped for new cubs once they grew too large to manage. Goering liked to showcase his wealth as much as he did his military importance. One of his favorite ways was wearing his three neck awards at once. Goering would wear his Blue Max, Knight's Cross, and his Grand Cross together. He received his Grand Cross for the victories of the Luftwaffe in 1940 during the French campaign. Goering was the only individual to receive this award during World War II. Goering liked to stand out and designed his own uniforms and was well known to change uniforms multiple times a day. On at least one hilarious occasion, he was forced to change due to one of his lion cubs soaking him in urine. His typical uniform was a soft pearl grey, departing from the blue-grey uniform scheme of the Luftwaffe. Goering liked to stand out in a crowd. In July of 1940, Hitler promoted Goering to the rank of Reich Marshal, a specially created rank, which made him senior to all other military ranks. Goering helped design new insignia for his new special rank. Shown here are his custom shoulder boards and collar tabs, showing crossed marshal batons surrounded by laurel leaves. This was his special breast eagle design, which had extra long and more pointed wings. Goering further wore many hats and visors. This one features a laurel wreath embroidered completely around the cap band. Also notice how the eagle is stitched directly to the visor cloth. Beyond his uniform, Goering had his own unique command flags, equally lavish and bombastic. Shown here is Goering's standard for his position of Reich Marshal in 1940, left and right. This was made yet more extravagant in 1941. It featured more command batons and gold laurel leaves. Goering also had a command flag for his position as Commander-in-Chief of the German Air Force, which was less frequently used once he was promoted to Reich Marshal. This flag features his Luftwaffe Field Marshal batons, and his Blue Max Award. Likely Goering's most recognizable badge of office was his baton, or batons, he had two. Batons signified the highest of military rank and prestige in the German military, with no other purpose than to display achievement. The custom had several origins, the most common being the trend of carrying ceremonial mazes in 16th century Europe. These became symbols of status or royalty. One example are maces frequently used in Parliament, where the House of Commons can only operate lawfully when the royal mace is present at the table. Away with this bubble! In World War II Germany, field marshals were the only rank to carry batons. 26 batons in total were awarded to 25 individuals. Goering was unique in that he was the only individual to receive two, one for his command of the Luftwaffe, and one for his superior position of Reich Marshal. His Reich Marshal baton was one of the most extravagant batons created during World War II, with over 600 diamonds. Goering's Reich Marshal baton is displayed at the West Point Museum in West Point, New York, and his Luftwaffe baton at the National Infantry Museum in Georgia.
Goering further stood out for his white uniforms, but they were not always admired. They earned him some scorn from the German people, who would watch him on newsreels in the theater. They wondered how he kept his uniform so pearly white, when many of them rationed soap to wash their own clothes. This skepticism was warranted. Goering, particularly in the second half of the war, tended to neglect his martial roles. Though he did remain an outdoorsman, he seemed willing to get dirty in his uniforms for sport. Goering had a love for the outdoors. He was Reich master of hunting and forests. But of course, when he hunted, he loved to dress up. Hans Ulrich Rudel, the top Stuka pilot of the war, recalled twice meeting Goering finding his costumes outlandish. First, a medieval hunting costume practicing archery with his doctor, and second, dressed in a red toga, fastened with a golden clasp, smoking an unusually large pipe. Likely the best quote on Goring's fashion is from Italian foreign minister Galeazzo Ciano, who once noted Goring wearing a fur coat that looked like what a high-grade prostitute wears to the opera. Goring's use of makeup for events likely added to this mockery. Goring was said to have taken to using makeup after meeting his second wife Emma, a well-known celebrity of the time. Goering's wedding to Emma was a state-sponsored event, for which Hitler was the best man. She is followed by Germany's best man, Hitler, who on this occasion literally is best man to the general. Goering's popularity was short-lived during World War II. Respect for Goering declined, first when the Luftwaffe lost the Battle of Britain, then steeply once German cities began to be regularly bombed. Furthermore, the Luftwaffe could not be relied on to resupply troops in the east, in places like Stalingrad. The war became unglamorous, and Goering lost interest. He focused more and more on himself, continuing to accumulate and hide wealth amongst his many properties. By war's end, he possessed up to $200 million worth of looted art and treasure. Champagne. Much of this art and treasure would never be seen again. Goering kept much of what he collected, that is to say stole, at his lavish country hunting estate, Karenhall, northeast of Berlin. Here he hunted and hosted large parties, where he displayed his wealth for all to see. To prevent Karenhall from falling into the hands of the advancing Red Army, Goering had the compound blown up in April of 1945. Though many of his treasures were moved to Birch's garden, not all of the work could be moved so late in the war. Art was left behind. Much of it was in fact buried in bunkers on the estate. These were of course discovered and looted, or simply vandalized, either by citizens in the area or the advancing Soviet soldiers. Several pieces were recovered, however, and some are on display in public museums, such as this Roman sarcophagus, decorated with lions on display in Berlin. Goering had acquired it in 1942 from an art dealer in Rome. Hitler finally turned on Goering in April of 1945. Goering, believing Hitler was unable to govern over Germany from the besieged city of Berlin, telegrammed him on the 23rd of April 1945, asking for permission to take over as leader of Germany. This telegram was intercepted by Goering's rival, Martin Bormann, who convinced Hitler Goering was a traitor. Subsequently, the SS were ordered to place Goering under arrest. He was held at his Mottendorf castle until the 5th of May, when he was freed by a passing Luftwaffe unit. He made his way to the US lines to surrender where he did so peacefully under arrangement. He carried with him many uniforms and possessions, including a significant stash of opioid pills. His surrender created some controversy. He was treated for a time as a VIP or statesman. This surrender is exaggerated in the 2000 production Nuremberg, though it's still a well worth watching film covering Goering's arrest and trial. I prefer to surrender to a fellow airman. There was, however, real truth to Goering's preferential treatment. He is shown here taking a stroll with an American serviceman after his capture. He is even shown here still wearing his diamond Luftwaffe pilot observer badge while in custody. He gave a full press interview where he was allowed to present himself as a diplomat of sorts to reporters. Goering believed he was going to get special treatment and that Eisenhower would want to use him in a command or governance role. He carried with him at his surrender a gold-plated Walter pistol, which he hoped to surrender to a top Allied commander. Goering's special treatment didn't last long, however. He would be taken to Nuremberg for trial. Part of his imprisonment meant going on a diet and kicking his drug addiction, so he'd be fit to stand trial. Goering's confidence and dominating presence rarely diminished during his trial. Goering was always sure to enter the courtroom first. Goering relished his time on the stand. He was a skilled speaker who took every opportunity to frame himself as a peacemaker and diplomat, 
who either tried to mitigate Nazi Germany's crimes or claim he was unaware of them. His refusal to accept any accountability at the trial only solidified him as an evil, manipulative man in history. Adding to his courtroom image were no doubt his famous sunglasses. These were one item Goring did not wear as an ostentatious fashion choice. These were Polaroid glasses, meant to help protect the eyes of the defendants. The Nuremberg trials were meticulously filmed, and at the time this required bright studio lights which were blinding during the long hours of the trial. Though Goring always tried to dominate the trial with flair, here he is trying to read a special statement to the court's disapproval during his plea. Ob ich mich schuldig oder nicht schuldig bekenne. I inform the court, the, the court that defendants were not entitled to make a statement. Ultimately, Goering was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was second in command in the world's most brutal war and the director of the slave labor program of Nazi Germany. After being found guilty, Goering may have used his charisma one last time. Goering managed to escape the hangman. He obtained a cyanide capsule, perhaps from a guard. Goering took every opportunity to charm anyone with influence he met. He presented one army lieutenant with his gold watch, pen, and a cigarette case in exchange for gaining access to some of his personal, confiscated belongings. Take it. But the drug may have also been smuggled to him by an honor guard for the trial. The few valuables I have, the valuables I have they are in my blue briefcase in the back of the After Goering's death, his body was displayed at the execution ground for witnesses. He was cremated and his ashes scattered. All right, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this video on Hermann Goering. I hope you have a nice rest of your day, and we'll see you in the next one.